starting recording and I'll get it in. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. And welcome to another week of 72 PC. This is Eric Fine. With me today, we have Tom Webster. Howdy, everyone. And Adam Jordan. Greetings. How are you guys doing on this Friday? I'm doing pretty good. Not How are you? Bad. Been doing too much gaming lately? Uh, yeah, actually. Not as much more as I would than, have liked. More than normal. Tom going on the light end again, being all responsible and doing that work thing. <laughs> oh my god, this week Work's has been hell. Overrated. Utter hell. Uh, speaking of which, what have you been playing then there, Adam? Sounds like you've been a little busy. Yes, I have. I've been playing Rocket League as normal. But I have also played Enter the Gungeon, which I said I was going to, and I actually did. How I, is that? I like, I like it a lot. I like it a lot. Um it has a lot, a lot of the same things that hooked me with the Binding of Isaac are hooking me with this again. But the actual core gameplay, the, the combat, is a lot more fun than Isaac. So what you, it doesn't have quite as many uh, like item synergies, but it makes up for it in the gameplay, and it's harder. Are I have there, yet to get past the third floor. Are there any synergies in it? Because that was my biggest thing about Isaac uh, still to this date is I like going yeah, through. Well, there are there are passive items. Um, one of them is like chain lightning. It chains, uh, you know, lightning in between your shots, which would work for multiple guns and stuff. So right. there is some of that. It's just not as prevalent as it is in Isaac. But the game is a lot of fun. I'm having a lot of fun with it. And it's uh, roguelike all the way to the bosses as well. Um, yeah, yeah, each floor has a, a number of bosses it could be. Um, it's all randomly generated secrets, that kind of stuff. Um, I might have the more you play out. it, the more you unlock, like, you'll unlock the new guns that'll now appear the next time you play, maybe, or you'll unlock a new shop dude that you can buy stuff in between runs, that kind of stuff. Oh, That's you can, pretty rad. You can buy yeah. items? Well, Okay, so in Isaac, you get, like, achievements, and it'll unlock, like, oh, this has appeared in the basement. Maybe when you play, you might run into this item now that you couldn't get before. This one, you you find these people that open up a shop. So in between runs, you can go into that shop and use the credits you get from previous runs to buy unlocks. So, like... Oh. So there will be four four items in the shop that you could pay credits for, and it will say, okay, well, I'll buy the credits for the t-shirt gun launcher and maybe the next time i play that that'll be unlocked or maybe please I'll tell find me that's that really a somewhere. gun that's actually a gun yeah a lot of the guns have really nice. interesting stuff there's like a t-shirt launcher uh there's one that was i can't remember what it was called but it looked exactly like that gun from the fifth element it says don't touch or don't push the red button <laughs> uh some some of the guns like the last bullet in your clip will do something special like that, that one specifically, like on the on the, when it shows your the clip on the right side, the bottom, the bottom bullet is a red button, and when it gets to that, it launches a rocket. Whereas normally nice. it's the laser. So there's a lot of interesting things, a lot of interesting guns. It's not just like shotgun, pistol. Has there been any modifications to it since that games came out? Because that was something about Isaac where it was like, oh, not much, not much. All of a sudden, bam! Here's this huge content patch. Since it's all roguelike, it's seamless. Yeah, I'm not sure. Not that I'm aware of. Maybe not yet. I'm definitely adding this but to yeah, my two by list. It's it's a lot it's a lot of fun. I might stream it sometime if you guys want to see like gameplay of it and stuff. That'd be great. Cause um, absolutely. Other, than that, other than that, I've been playing The Witness again. Um That game is so beautiful. That game is absolutely beautiful. <laughs> How many less hairs do you have in your head as of right now though? Uh not too many. I got stuck on that one a little bit today, but uh, it's fun just to explore. Like, if you get stuck on a puzzle and it's frustrating, you can just walk around and enjoy the sights, and you might find something else you didn't know about. Uh, the Witness has an element to it that a lot of people talked about with uh, No Man's Sky, 
where there's this you just kind of, like you said wander around and relax and you're going to see things that you didn't notice before yeah and it's just visually just very pleasing to just walk yes oh yeah so uh this week i i actually i'll talk about the witness during during my turn <laughs> well that's I'll... all i've played so uh what what have you played today or this week tom uh, so to, to get the, the quick stuff out of the way, um, Dota, of course, um, I have been picking up Shadow Run again, uh, starting to go through that. I never finished Shadow Run Returns, uh, so I've been picking that up again, played a little bit of that. I love the game. I adore Shadow Run Returns. It's got... Oh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, it's got a, uh, a great soundtrack. Uh, the story is pretty cyberpunkish. Uh, it's fantastic, um, and it really feels like an RPG. It doesn't feel like, you know, well, it's kind of an RPG because we've got stat trees, but basically all the characters are the same. Um, I started out the game playing as, like, a, a hacker decker person, and my job was subterfuge and, you know, go in, make everything attack the other people, um, and, you know, try to get out without causing a big physical ruckus. This time I'm going through as, like, a troll melee basher guy. So I walk up and hack people to death with machetes. Um, is this the one they did the crossplay with, with the uh, 360? Um, I don't know. This was, I don't think so. This is like a uh, an indie uh, isometric tactical RPG. Okay, okay. But you, you said Shadowrun, right? Yes, Shadowrun Returns. Okay. Um, so it's it's a lot of fun if you haven't picked up shadow run uh they've got two expansion packs out now um you can get it for very cheap just about everywhere so go pick it up uh on top of that i have been playing uh i played a little bit of star trek the 25th anniversary dos game i forgot how hard that game was um it is not like games today so today you know you load up you load up a game <laughs> it's like hey you have to you know, go to planet X, Y, Z and, and accomplish your mission. So I open up the star chart and it, there's just a field of stars and I click on one and it says, ah, oh, you went to the wrong place. All these guys are going to kill you now and you inevitably die. Apparently you have to go through the game's manual and look up the star chart there, then figure <laughs> out which star you have to go to and, and go to the right one on your screen. So you have to have, you know, one hand holding the manual and the other playing the game. So it's, your pirated copy didn't come with the manual? <laughs> no, no, this this came Whoa, from Gog. On, this came from Gog. I bought this legitimately. It is DRM free, um, and it did come with the manual. But it's uh, it's a manual, right? When when even when you're a kid, when I bought Genesis games, I just slap the cartridge in and hit. Ah, I'll figure out the buttons when I get in the game. That's fine. No one reads the manual, uh, but in this game, you absolutely need it. Uh, so that's that's a little odd. Some games in the past have done that before. Um, there have been some really classic examples of the manual being absolutely key mm -hmm. to the game, uh, or the box or art the box, in some yes. circumstances. Metal Gear Solid, well, but actually, we will, we will the, talk about that. Later. <laughs> the DOS era, um, there was a game called The Red Crystal that had a huge manual, a lot of stuff for the game in it, but it used the manual as a very, very cool technique of anti-piracy because I mean these yes. were on three and a half inch floppies, really easy to rip. Every time you would start it up, it would tell you, you have to go to this page, this paragraph, this line, this word. What is it? Oh. And that's how you authenticated your game every time you started. It was it was pretty effective. Copy Unless production. you photocopied your friend's manual. Yeah, but right. these manuals were like 80 pages. This was a big oh, okay. manual. Okay. And back yeah. then, it I was mean, a book. Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it, it was a book. Mail. Um, other than that, uh, I did beat Link's Awakening. I've been going through it slowly over the past couple of months just to play it again. Uh, that's the original Game Boy Zelda game, uh, and also one of my favorite Zelda games of all time. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. Um, I did get stuck at some parts, but uh, uh, overall, it's, it's just a great, fantastic game. Um, I have never played, and this is probably a PC gamer mortal sin, <laughs> I had never played Grim Fandango until this week um totally. i i am <laughs> i i'm just like uh i want to say an hour or two in but i absolutely love it this is an old it's a remastered edition of an old lucas arts point and click adventure game 
based around the Mexican Day of the Dead. You're like this <laughs> this guy who's selling travel packages to get people from like their their day of the dead limbo into the afterlife and if you've been really good you can take the bullet train into the afterlife which takes four minutes uh otherwise this guy he wasn't very good so he's like ah well you get this walking stick here and you're the sales guy that's trying to sell these travel packages it's just it's hilarious in a weird kitschy lucas art sort of way uh and i am i am loving the shit out of it uh but i did also buy the witness so i have been playing yes. through that um i i get it i understand what jonathan blow talks about when he talks about the way he creates puzzle games he doesn't create puzzle games as in oh they'll never figure this out it's he's trying to without words without showing you a tutorial he's trying to explain a concept to the player seamlessly throughout gameplay and have them understand and grasp the concept to make it through the game. Um, there was one puzzle in The Witness where it, basically The Witness is all about just drawing lines on on squares. That's literally the entire game, but it's not as boring as it sounds. Um, <laughs> there was there was one puzzle, uh, and if if you guys know, it's the one with the trees and the apples and the mm. weird branching lines. Mm -hmm. I, I got frustrated with one puzzle. I'm like, oh, there's only like six solutions. So I, I went and I found the solution and then I'm like, hold on, if I go forward right now, I'm going to have no idea what I did. And I'm going to have to brute force every puzzle from here on in. Mm -hmm. I can't do that. So I, I looked at the solution. I'm like, what? I, I don't get this. Because I hadn't made the connection yet that they were related to trees. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really spoiling anything because this is a puzzle you come to 10 minutes into the game. Mm -hmm. So I had to look around at my surroundings and figure out exactly what blow was trying to communicate to me about this puzzle mm -hmm. uh, and it turns out that the trees map exactly to the puzzle and you have to figure out which way the branches yeah. should, should lead. <laughs> it was yeah, it was a great eye-opening experience yeah hey right underneath that puzzle something re i mean i know it's not underneath it but i mean that puzzle right after that you can find something really cool in the game but yeah adam brought something to my attention today that caused me to uh, reinstall this it maybe spoilers well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say anything in depth outside of yeah. Tom. The game does not show you how to solve every puzzle. Yeah. Really. There's there, uh, there's meta puzzles. There's more to Jesus. the boxes with the lines. Oh, so this is gonna be Fez there's, all over again. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Lots of Fez ish. Oh stuff shit, going Fez. On. Okay, okay. This this but is why. A... <laughs> here, here we go. Here yeah, we go. you got the notebook, um, right? <laughs> on, this is this is terrible terrible podcasting uh because i'm showing it to my buddies on camera and you guys can't see it but i've got this i've got this black notebook here um that i put all of my game notes in and so far it's been filled with you know shadow run tips and you know stuff npcs tell me and stuff like that but i'm gonna have to break out a page draw... just just for the witness time out, time out. Have to draw time some out. did you say page <laughs> Tear out a page, dedicate that to everything else. Okay. You got okay, the notebook for the witness, notebook. dude. I'm, the first sitting I had in the, the witness, I took five pages of notebook paper. Because, um, okay, I'm not going to go. I yeah. I don't want to say I much. Just keep, just keep playing. Yes. There is a whole lot more to the game than what you think there is now, and you're going to have a blast with it. Anyone yeah. who goes to I play this so game, it will take you a long time. There's a good chance that you will have a week stint where you don't play. You need to use a notepad. You need to keep track of certain things to have, figure, remember how to solve things, or you're going to be screwed when you come back to the game. Mm -hmm. Because when you're learning that it. in the middle, sucks. Yeah. I have encountered puzzles where um, I'll I'll go and get frustrated with something and walk away and find a puzzle I know I can do. But then the one right after that is one of these that I haven't the the topic hasn't been broached on how to solve that. So I get stuck right there, and now I have to figure out where the you know level one puzzle is for that thing. Right, yeah, so, no, that's we will be streaming it this week. So That's stay. something I really like about that design. It's an open world puzzle game yeah. where if yeah. you get bored or stuck in a certain type of puzzle, you go to a different biome and there's a whole different style of puzzles now available. Yeah. And as long as you don't do what Tom did and walked in in the middle of it, yeah. it tends to gradually walk you into them until you get yeah. towards the center and then all hell breaks loose. Yeah, it's designed really well. 
All in all, that game at this point is two years old, and I still highly recommend that to anyone who likes puzzle games. And that's all I've got this week. Uh, mine is just the norm of... I have the Rocket League, Factorio, which I am actually borderline about to get to the first time ever the end game. Nice. I have a factory so well that right. I cannot lose. It's the first <laughs> time ever I've actually managed that. I only have 40 hours in this factory, so, um, you know. Very nice. For the record, if you guys haven't seen it, um, there's a guy on Imager that has 500 hours in a single factory. It is insane. God. If you see his production Holy sets up setups, it's just outrageous. If you know anything about the game and find it even remotely interesting, you need to look at that. Hmm. And then outside of that, I finished up the Gears of War 4. That game nice. is great. Yeah. I have not done any of the multiplayer, but just that campaign. That mm -hmm. campaign is fantastic. Did, did you play any of the other ones? Um, so I played probably two thirds of the way through the first halfway of the mm -hmm. second and just horde in the third. Okay. But you do not need any prior context to play this game. They do very, very good job of giving you a backdrop on everything in a really fun way. They make the tutorial to the game, a story lesson of the past without spoon feeding you how to play. Oh, that's good. It's it's so, a very well done tutorial as well as a briefing. So is it is it a completely different story within the same universe, or is it the same characters from the other games? Or so you will see that character lineage is a thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to go too deep in there because I mean I don't think it's a spoiler. I'm pretty sure it was in trailers, but I I'm it's a new game. I don't want to say too much when it comes to that. Right. Um, story wise. I will not say much once again, but very beginning, you'll realize fucking robots. <laughs> um, but I'm not going to say much more about that story outside of it's, it's great. It's good. Yeah. The very end of the game, the last chapter was at this point, I was, the game has great pacing. Soon mm -hmm. as you're like, okay, I'm almost kind of getting done with doing this kind of stuff. It's almost, almost getting to the point where it might start to get boring. Bam, switch. Something nice. new comes That's up, good. and it's a good transition to it. And yeah, soon as that is, it's like, bam! All of a sudden, this story element comes. It just grabs you to where I was looking for treasures and stuff, and all of a sudden, I realized myself rushing through zones because I wanted to get to the next part of the story. Yeah, and That's then a good sign. right when the story yeah, gets yeah, to the yeah. point where you're like, well, what's going to happen? Bam! One more change to switch up play, gets you to the end of the game, and it's it's great. Nice. Now that's um, also on PC, right? That's actually where I played it. Um, okay. So I want to tout on this a little. Microsoft is doing something kind of cool, blurring the lines of their two platforms, where the Microsoft Store is available on the Xbox One and the Windows. They have a travel anywhere thing. If you buy it for an ID or your gamer tag for Xbox One, and that's also your Windows account, you can take that game over to Windows or back to Xbox One. Ooh, that's I have cool. not tried it out that's yet to see the actual feature. practicality of it. Yeah. But I can say that I downloaded Gears of War 4, no issues, installed, no issues, put it up to Ultra, and ran right through it. Nice. So I think they're on to a really good thing. They're porting Halo 5's Forge over, and mm -hmm. I'm really hopeful the next Halo I'll be playing on PC. Nice. That would be really nice. And that, the last great um, you know, Halo PC game was Halo 1, because 2 didn't really fare that well. Well, I, it, you're in messy territory when you make a game for consoles, and then yeah. as an afterthought, how do I port it? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That's probably why we, we never saw any other Halo ports after that for the PC. Yes, but I, I really think Halo 6 will come PC. Um, Forge on PC for 6 is going to be fantastic. And those who, I mean, everyone should know what Forge is. It's Halo's map-making thing that caught fire for Halo 3, and they've left it in since. Community-generated maps are just so awesome. Yeah, PC modders are going to have a heyday with that. <laughs> oh yeah 
Awesome. I can't wait for the Galaxy Note 7 grenade. <laughs> Frags away. Screen shards are everywhere. Instead of the brute spikers, you're just throwing Galaxy devices. Jeez, that would be great. Also, for PC, though, did you guys see the Dishonored stuff? Dishonored 2. A little bit. So, um, the console port's great. The gameplay, from what I've heard so far, has been really nice, very well. But the PC port is having some serious issues with performance. People are not able to keep their frame rates up. There's people with 1080s, with i7s, that can't keep above 60 frames. They're really? constantly staying below 60 frames with a 1080. Does the game even look that good? I mean, the game, from what I've seen, looks like it's, it's a good-looking game. I mean, it'll they'll push it past 1080. But, I mean, right. oh, hold on, the 1080 graphics cards, not resolution, yeah, yeah, are not able to keep up 60. I realized I was a little ambiguous there. So that that's really weighing it down. And that would be frustrating for me. I spend that kind of money on a graphics card and can't play a game. <laughs> yeah, that's oh man. I, I thought I thought companies like after after the big stink that the latest Arkham game caused, I thought that companies, you know, might have learned their lesson even a little bit by saying, Hey, if there's a really bad PC port, let's just let's hold that back a little bit and then release it. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of developers are afraid of the scorn of, oh, you're neglecting PC because I'll admit it, PC people can um they can be a little touchy. They don't get something right touchy. away, <laughs> they get a little bitchy and um they have it out for a developer because they didn't bring it to the PC. That yeah. that, that said, I think I mean so we we will look at the most classic example of PC players clamoring for a, a game to be released like nothing I've ever seen, where the developer is just says, yeah, look, we're doing it, but you just got to hold your horses because we're doing this correctly, is mm -hmm. Grand Theft Auto Five, right? Hit yeah. the PC, hit the 360. Everyone's like, oh, PC version, and Rockstar waited, I want to say, a year. Right? It was a while. Yeah, it was quite a while. They they waited till they remastered it and put it on, you know, the, the PS4 and Xbone. And then the PC version came out. And everyone over that year when it was console exclusive was freaking out and saying, Oh my god, you have to give us GTA five right now. It's like the best game ever and we all want to play it. We all mm -hmm. want to mod it. We all want to hack it and you know, do all the crazy things that we do in GTA and PC games in general. Um and when Rockstar released it, I mean, other than the game being 60 gigs, um, it is <laughs> you know, one of the, in classic Rockstar fashion, uh, one of the most rock-solid PC ports of a oh, game yeah. I've ever played. It's, it's a joy to It was play. great. It controls well. Um, amazingly enough, unlike GTA 4, um, you know, it's it's fairly efficient. It runs on a wide variety of hardware. Yeah, it's kind of a beast of a game, but when you can run it, it runs really well. It's Had not all kinds of graphics settings options too. Yeah, like, they, did yeah. Not, they did not skimp for the PC version of that at all. They actually had a, a, a slider that showed how much RAM your settings would use versus how much RAM video RAM you have in your video card. So oh, yeah. you could see as you turned on, you know, like high resolution grass textures or water stuff, you can see that bar go up and how much of your video RAM you're going to be using before you even start playing. And Rockstar didn't do the thing where they, they baby you and coddle you. They understand <laughs> the PC market. So they say, hey, look, you've got this much video RAM. And if you push it past that point, there's red text that says, dude, we're going to let you do this, but it's going to be fucking unstable, man. I'm, we're, we're warning you right up front. This will crash at some point. And I had a 760. I didn't have a great graphics card. I'm like, ah, I can, I can push that a little bit. And I did. And it was mostly stable. But Rockstar let me do it. And they warned me up front that it might be unstable. It, oh, man, it's fantastic. I think if publishers, to get back to the original point, I think if publishers took the Rockstar stance of, Let's hold back and um, and not release anything until it's good and ready. Then we wouldn't have you know major issues like this. We wouldn't have giant riots in the street. Yeah. Oh, also, there was one more thing I wanted to bring up about the Dishonored. In a uh, typical new game release fashion, 
it had a nine gig day one patch. So for That's those a lot of, of you, gigs. <laughs> so for those of you with data caps, let's say you, well, I guess you shouldn't do this anyway, but you just downloaded the game, sixty gigs worth, and then bam, you have a six or nine gig day one patch on you. And for any game that's online or you play online for, you have to take that patch before you do anything. Yeah. Some I find... people probably couldn't play it on release day because they didn't have enough time to download the patch and play it. I find yeah. the whole notion absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> there are small occasions where I understand it, but I feel that developers are starting to take advantage of this. Everyone's online. Let's push a game out because the publishers are down our neck and then let's just patch it because i mean let's be honest they have to have the game to the developer or the publisher probably what two three months beforehand so they have all that idle time so they're pushing out updates we'll we'll just fix it in post yeah i mean that's essentially what it's coming (laughs) down to saying (laughs) you know back uh, i'm probably gonna get some flack for this but back in my day when game developers released a game they were finished they didn't release any of this half-baked stuff. Well, Grandpa Which is a Webster. Lot, right? I mean, there, there, <laughs> there have been game companies in back in older console generations that have actually gone through and recalled games because they found game-breaking bugs where you know save files would be exploded or or yeah. you know the game would crash randomly, and they actually had to issue a recall to the retailers and mm-hmm. trash all that stock or reflash all that stock and then send it back out again. It's happened, but mm-hmm. it was a whole lot more rare because game companies took a whole lot of time to make sure that they were releasing a you know a finished product before they put it on right. the shelves. Well, they the, had to because it was only a physical version. Yeah, I the, miss those days. I really yeah. miss those days. I miss those days, but then, I mean, yes, I won't complain about day one patch till my, it's blue in the face, but I don't know about you guys. When I come across a bug, it may not be game breaking, but it sucks. I want it patched. Yeah. Uh, depending, depending. You know, the the bird people in Red Dead Redemption. <laughs> well, that's fucking different. weird. That's different. But fucking awesome. But that was right. also rare. I never came across that in the game, nor yeah, to my roommate. Did. Right. I mean, we're talking like um, think. Okay, you're playing a Bethesda game. Okay, it's gonna okay. have fun. Oh, it's oh. gonna have tons of fun little <laughs> bugs in it. Yeah. Of course, that it's Bethesda. They're it's cute, charming. adorable. We know you're <laughs> making too big of a game, so you're gonna have little bugs. But let's say you have one where you swing your sword at a certain enemy and then your sword's gone. And not that I went back in your inventory, but it's gone. I mean, that's kind of... It it sucks. It really sucks. And games back in the day had those kind of issues. Mm -hmm. People just had to kind of get around them. They weren't prevalent, but there were some issues. Mm Mm-hmm. I remember um, one of the podcasts I liked to listen to is uh, Beastcast. They were talking that one of the games had a game-breaking bug to where they would call the customer support. They would have them mail the game to them, and they would send them a new version. Oh. That's the actual publisher. Yeah, yeah. That's messy. And that also makes me think of Battletoads. (laughs) (laughs) I I do... I do appreciate the ability for for game developers to update their games on the fly. And we've seen game developers do, you know, great things and boring things that boring things like, oh, yeah, we found this weird edge case bug that we didn't catch in testing. And otherwise, it was a complete game. But, you know, here here's a bug fix just so you can have it. You know, it's like 10 megs. Um, we, we've seen game companies put out uh, little content patches, um, you know, with uh, we were talking earlier about uh, Binding of Isaac offline, uh, where the developers said, hey, here's all this stuff that we made. If you guys want it, you know, it's yeah. already a complete game, but here you go. We just yeah. think you'd like it. And it's great. That adds value to the game. It, it keeps the game fresh and alive. It's not, you know, this stale thing that you bought 10 years ago. It's right. it's new and updated all the time. It gets people I, playing the game again. Yeah. I, I just, I think, especially in, in day one patching, it is so abused. When I bought GTA V on the PS3, I popped that disc in. I was ready. I had you know, structured my whole day around. I'm not doing anything except playing GTA for the next 24 hours. And I had like a, like 
10 gigs or something. It was, it was some ridiculous number, but it basically meant that I couldn't play the game for the next six hours while it downloaded everything, extracted the patch, installed the patch. That's it, frustrating. Doesn't begin to describe the feeling. <laughs> yeah. I was I was screaming at the PS3. It's a console. It's supposed to be a console. It's supposed to be this thing I slap in a game and it's done. I get to play it now online. I get it right. You don't want a, a bug going unnoticed and people cheating in the game because of it. I wasn't yeah. playing online. I didn't load the online. I clicked single <laughs> player. I just wanted to kill people as Trevor. That's all I wanted to do. But it took me an extra six hours to do that. It's yeah. EA while they are notorious for some bad practices on their gaming platform or their sport platforms are really good on that. Um, all the updates are optional. You don't have to take them, but if you play online, they force you to update. Yeah. But I mean, the update, like it tells you the very beginning, like, Hey, do you want to take it? No. Okay. And then it doesn't tell you again until you go to play online. It's like, Hey, you have to take this. Yeah. Which is very tasteful. Yeah. could do the technology is here right games could do the modern mmo thing of saying hey um we've got this update only only a little bit of of the the game actually requires this patch most of it's like environmental patches and fixing bugs in certain areas like physical areas of the game um so we're gonna let you in after you patch like 50 megs uh but we're gonna patch the other stuff in the background and when you walk to that area, we'll stop you and load for an extra bit while we load that area in. It would be great if GTA V said, hey, man, we've got a gig to install because we could corrupt save games accidentally in these weird edge cases. So we're going to patch that and then let you play. And then for like the online stuff and the stuff you're not going to see right away, we're going to patch that in the background. You can do that. That's a thing that exists today. It's actually not that hard to do. Game engines do support that. Why? Why isn't that a more common thing? Why am I only seeing that uh, in MMOs? I, I don't get it. Yeah, because they're the ones that actually care about maintaining a player base rather than just game sales. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we, we're going to have the, the world's best, best segue um, in which we say this section is now over and the yes. next section Let is now beginning. Let us do the next one. <laughs> yes, quite. So, so next section... Uh, Vive is going wireless. Sort of. Yeah. Sort of. So um, the Vive is doing some interesting stuff. Um, we knew it had to come. No one likes the tail. You kind of stop and forget about it, but no one likes it. I mean, come on. You guys like having a tail walking around, people stepping on it all day? No. It... No. I've never had that problem, but I would imagine it'd be not so fun. Wait, you've never like stared at a moon and like turned into a big monkey or anything? Mm. That's happened occasionally. Yeah. And then someone has to come cut it on. Uh, uh, wrong kind of tail, sorry. But anyway. So um, <laughs> this new um, pack they have, well, all the cores that run to your computer will now go to this wireless, um, looks like a uh, external power bank that will actually strap to the back of your helm or your um, um, headset. And that's going to be fantastic. I mean, they, people are saying that it's a lot more immersive. They have some beta videos up of people playing it. They say the latency is seamless, which is good. Oh, you yeah. Have, I don't know if any That's of you guys experience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you have latency in VR, you're puking. It causes some major issues. Before they, they patched and uh, optimized Job Simulator a bit more, it would have major frame rate drops in certain areas with too many objects on the screen. And it was, it literally would cause me to, you know, sort of trip and catch myself. It's really disorienting. It's a weird feeling. <laughs> so <it's... coughs> I think I really like the idea of the battery pack and stuff being on, on the back of your head because the Vive is very front heavy. Um, you know, the straps, the straps keep it in place, but especially when, you know, playing golf games and golf land, when you're, you're looking down at the ground at the ball to swing because of the way the Vive is built, because it's so top heavy, it feels like it's going to just fall off your face on the floor. You have to make sure it's got, you know, real, real tight grip to it. But mm -hmm. evening that out with like a, a wireless pack in the back, I think it's actually a great thing. Yeah, it's, it's an absolutely great idea. But uh, seems like there might be some problems with it, though. So one small price little point. What's the price point? The price First point. Off. So the good thing going for the Vive people is the Vive is not cheap. 
So they understand if extra peripherals are a little expensive, they're kind of targeting a market that might have a little expendable income. Right. Bad thing is, it's still really kind of pricey. We're talking $220 <laughs> to cut your tail off. That's not that bad. That's really not that bad. But what and if I was, what if I was to tell you? <laughs> yeah, what would I? What if I told you your tail would grow back after an hour and a half? Yeah, that's an issue. So the, you see, I might I might pay the two twenty just to avoid the issue of pets eating the cords because that's an issue in my house where <laughs> yeah, where well, animals chew up cords and ruin expensive electronics. But an hour and a half. Yeah, oh, that so seems kind of. Yeah, so it's an hour and a half. Good news, they have plans in the future, and this might be when I dip in, of making a bigger one that lasts longer that can be stored in the player's pocket. So you still have a tail from your head to your pocket, but your feet are not going to step on anything. I think I, I think I would do that. Now, if they gave yeah. me, like, the Vive waiters, where I, like, put on <laughs> these big, big rubber pants full of lithium oh, batteries Jesus. With, with the, you know, the big overalls hanging over... Yeah, I would totally get into that too. I'm watching Tom walk into his office with these huge waders with these battery pack. <laughs> with this huge battery pack in it. He has a uh, fly rod attachment for a Vive controller, <laughs> and he's doing virtual fishing with this net on the side of his shoulder. Oh, this that would be so cool! And, and at the, the same time, is, we cut to you in the wilderness actually fishing. You've, you've got <laughs> you've got a charging port on the back of your pants, and you literally just back into the wall, and now you're charging. It's almost like docking like you had a mech, but then when you realize it's only a fucking video game controller, <laughs> you are wearing a video game controller. Hey, man. Hey, man. PC gaming is serious business. So I, I like this idea. I agree with you. Once they get the external battery pack figured out, once it's more than an hour and a half, it, even, it seems like such a small difference, but even at two hours, I would jump into this. When I, when I play the Vive, I'm usually in it for about two hours. If there was to, say, 30 more bucks, they put in a second one of the stations that go with the headset, I think that'd be okay because then you alternate back and yeah. forth. Yeah. Because the thing, for anyone who has not worked with a Vive or Oculus, I think PSVR is a little different because its headset's less cumbersome. Um, putting it on and off isn't really a small task. I mean, it's, it's a very sizable headset, and there's a lot of cordage. And with the Vive especially, you have controllers strapped to your hands or you're holding. And you can't see anything when you drop them down. So you have to take this pack out, take off the headset, take the cords from behind the computer, plug them back in, find your controllers, make sure you know where they're at, put your headset back on, and then pick back up your controllers. Yeah. And that's... The Xbox 360 wireless controller would never have caught on if it had an hour and a half battery life. Yeah, I completely right. agree. Uh, battery life. So problems. hopefully, hopefully the the upgraded pack is at a similar price point. Yes. Because if they can increase or uh, you know level out the ratio of price to battery life, it's an excellent idea because that cord is annoying. Yeah. And the worst thing about the cord is initially it's not a problem, but as you keep playing, it twists, mm -hmm. and that's when it'll like it'll hook your foot or yeah. something. Because eventually, especially you get... games where you turn 360, you're not just standing looking in the same direction the whole time. Yeah, I mean, I love watching people fall in VR <laughs> when they try to brace on tables. <laughs> hey, but I, I don't I like my seeing pants people. The last time I tried to play VR, <laughs> I don't like watching people fall because they hit the cord. Because that's not fair. Yeah, that's not yeah. them being stupid. Yeah, I, like in games like uh, like Hollow Point, where it's it's entirely room scale and there's enemies coming at you from all directions. Something like this could be amazing because I, it's not such a big deal after you've been you know using VR for a while because you, you kind of anticipate the tale. You've got like the the cord kick that everyone does because everyone after they play Vive for a couple hours realize that you can just you know sort of sweep with your foot and kick this cord out of the way. It's it's like a, a VR move. It's a training site that you develop. Um, but if you don't have to do that anymore, I could see the immersion increasing uh, a whole lot. It would it would make it so you know I'm not being constantly reminded that there are things in the outside world, which is just perfect for me because that's why I'm in VR. I'm in VR. <laughs> Reality sucks, and I will substitute my own. 
So this is a really good thing for it, but let's stick one step back and make a checklist of what it now takes to really have the best Vive experience. You're talking, That's true. You're talking a $1,300 PC build probably in mid-tier because you have to have 980, 390. 390 is a cheap way to go with a good AMD, yeah. but still then you're still looking $900, but you're going AMD Radeon. And then you're talking $1,000 for a wireless Vive headset. A thousand dollars, but I mean, we, we have to keep in mind, you know, the Vive is the Lamborghini of VR. Yeah, right. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not the Lamborghini. Maybe the Lamborghini is like something they've got at Valve right now. That's an entire room. It's a Mercedes. Like, it's a it's a literal holiday. This is the yeah. Mercedes of VR. It's it's not your budget VR. Your budget VR would be cardboard, right? That's your Ford, your used Ford Pinto of VR. No, 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 um, dude. Cardboard is a fucking go kart. <laughs> <laughs> It's your riding lawnmower of VR. Yeah. The econ version is PSVR, which yeah, yeah, that's that's your used Honda Civic of VR. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, I I don't see the price increase for the best VR experience. I mean, it's it is two hundred bucks, but it's two hundred bucks to make that the immersion that much better. Um, and I would I would definitely definitely pay for that. Um, now. I will say this could give you an unfair advantage in Vive multiplayer games because in hover junkers, when you're spinning around constantly and getting tangled up in the cords, that's part of the game is figure out how to untangle yourself while not getting shot while shooting other people. Yeah, if you don't a... have to worry about that, you are the best pro ever instantaneously. Well, yeah, because the big thing is like, do I turn 90 degrees to the left to shoot a guy? And rip my or rip the cords out of the computer, or do I turn yeah. 270 degrees to the right to shoot the same guy? The amount, yeah, it you know, it sounds like the stupidest thing ever when you say it out loud, but that goes through your head when you're in the middle of a gunfight in Hover Junkers. It's really annoying, but those thoughts happen. And also, it did because Hover Junkers is next to dead right now. Oh, that sucks. Worst thing about VR: small player base. Yep. Yep. But talking about dead games, those tend to be good. <laughs> like Guns of Vicarus. <laughs> but. Yeah. So um, I think we all have a few of these. Um, back in the day when we was on consoles, you know, those games didn't transport over to the computer, so we don't play them anymore. So back in the day, Adam, what did you used to play whenever it was on console? Console exclusives. Well, I have bought consoles specifically for games. One of those was the Metal Gear Solid oh. series. I bought a PS3 just to play Metal Gear Solid 4. You mean watch? Uh, <laughs> pl you know, watch some, play a little, watch a lot more, there's play like, some more. There's like 45 minutes of gameplay in MGS4. That's, that's so there's like 10 hours of too. movie. Yeah. That's its appeal. It's, you know, it's a giant cinematic movie, video game thing. It's quirky. It's funny. It's emotional at parts. It's good. So so did you feel justified buying the PS3 for Metal Gear Solid 4? Uh, initially, no, because to be honest, I never even finished Metal Gear Solid 4 all the way. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> but it okay, led... you have to finish that. Yeah, it I know. I know. It's, the whole it's series. A, yeah. Yeah, I know. I've, Did I, you I've say actually, destroys? I've watched, I've watched yes. somebody play through the ending. I've just never, I never did it myself. So I did see the ending, but yeah, I bought it for that, but I did play a lot of other games on it that made it worth the purchase for sure. You see, I bought a PS3 for a game. I played that game all the way through and dabbled a little bit with resistance because I've had it before. Yeah. I bought the PS3 strictly for The Last of Us. Yeah. So you were absolutely justified in that purchase. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. That that was one of the best games I've ever played. I have never played it. You it is were... so good. It's one of the best stories I've I've played in a game. And it's, game... it's one of those games that, you know, a lot of games, they have an excellent story and the gameplay is pretty good. Or they have, like, amazing gameplay and the story's you know, passable. This Ooh. is one of the first games I've played that the gameplay is just as good as the story. Both are excellent. So it's Naughty I've, Dog. I've only heard good things. Mm -hmm. Naughty Dog, if you see anything by them, it's going to be good. But like Adam said, that story, 
the story all the way to the end keeps you going. Actually, at the very mm-hmm. beginning, when most stories were the best, I guess it was really strong at the beginning. But right after the beginning, I felt the story dropped off. And then it just shot back up really quick, though. Mm-hmm. And then it just kept going. It's one of those games you think about after you finish it. Quite a while after you finish it. like. So I, I can go we'll get a, a cheap, 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 because I, I have gotten rid of my PS3. I could get a cheap PS3 and The Last of Us. And that, that would be worthwhile. Actually, you know what? I have a I... PS3 and The Last of Us, and I live close to you. So <laughs> if you would like to borrow true. that to play it, you have, you're more than welcome to. I haven't turned my PS3 on in months. Or, I think I might. Also, I have a PS3 still in Ohio at someone's house that you can get it from because I'm not getting it anytime soon. And then you can just <laughs> have the damn PS3 until I come get it from you when I get my damn Wii controllers that you've had for two years. So you'll never get it. Got it. Okay. But I got one question, Adam. Is he yes. an asshole? Who? The Last of Us. Oh. Yes and no. It's not. It's not a yes or no answer. It's. It's all perspective, I guess. And when Tom becomes a real gamer, he'll be able to know what that question means. <laughs> yeah. No one should have been yeah. playing games for the last five years and not played yeah. that game. It is I, such a good it's game. It's good. Just play it. You'll play it. I believe Keep up on consoles very <laughs> I, I want to say a year before they came out as i i totally eschewed myself of of the vast majority of console experiences mm-hmm. because i had such a shit time with the 360 and the ps3 and that, that was yeah. due to a lot of factors it wasn't due to any one thing i'll say the yeah. 360 era was really good with games because yeah. i mean you had microsoft coming into their own finally playstation finally getting a really good first party development team and naughty dog I shouldn't yeah. say finally, yeah. going, but I mean, they started but, I mean, with as, really good as stuff. As far as exclusives go, I mean, so a lot of the great stuff that came out on consoles also hit PC later. Mm-hmm. The Last of Us being, you know, a huge notable exception. But things like, you know, the like Bioshock. Bioshock hit the PC fairly quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I mean, that, you got that, Uncharted still. I mean, all I was of never not... into Uncharted. I, I, I played Uncharted. Yeah, it's good, though. I, it's good. It's, it's well good. It's out. it's not something I'd buy a console for, though. Not for, yeah. but if you have it, it's a good addition. Yeah. Yeah, I can say that. So, this isn't exactly following the topic, but to continue on the train of buying consoles for a singular game, I think I, I might be the worst out of all of us. Um, <laughs> I played, I bought Halo PC. As a kid, I was listening to gaming podcasts. I was reading reviews. I'm like, oh my god, everyone loves Halo. It's it's like the best thing ever. It changes first person shooters for everyone all the time. And you know, back then, the world changing first person shooters were you know Doom, Half Life, Quake, uh, Counter Strike, and um, and you know Goldeneye and Perfect Dark. I was gonna say you're forgetting for, the, the big one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so Goldeneye Goldeneye said, hey first person shooters aren't exclusively for PC anymore. You can now play those on console. And it was this world revelation of people saying, oh my God, we can finally build these on this thing because someone figured out how to make the controls not absolute shit. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then you had games like Medal of Honor come out. Those controls were absolute shit. Go back and play it sometime. (laughs) Oh, they have not (laughs) aged well. They are so rough. They're so rough. I, I so I loaded up my emulator. I wanted to play some Goldeneye. I'm like, oh, I loved Goldeneye, man. I'm gonna get right back into this. I no, nope, no. Nope. I lasted 30 minutes. I'm like, I can't do yeah. this anymore. Turok aged it's well. Goldeneye really did not. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I bought Halo PC because Halo came out on PC um, a bit after it launched on the Xbox. You know, after the hype train had kind of moved on. I'm like, all right, I've got a gaming PC. I'll see what this is all about. So I bought it. It was, to this day, one of the best single-player experiences I have ever had. It was amazing. It had giant worlds. The story gripped me, pulled me in. The twist, like, looking back on it, you're like, yeah, okay, it's it's the big twist. Everyone knows it's going to happen, right? But back then, I was just like, my, my little kid mind was blown. I was like, oh, my God, I had no idea. Guilty Spark just screwed me over. What the hell, dude? And... The ending was appropriate. It was epic. You finish the game, you're like, oh my god, I just want more. The only thing I want right now is more of that feeling. Mm-hmm. 
And then, then multiplayer, because the PC had online multiplayer through GameSpy, which was awesome. <laughs> that was through GameSpy? It was wow. through GameSpy. Wow. GameSpy managed the servers, um, which were filled with cheaters. There was no oh, admin yeah. interfaces. There was nothing. There was no way to kick people from the servers. It was it was so bad looking back on it, but we had so much fun. Just, you know, getting the, the two ships and flying them in Blood Gulch and trying to kill each other on modded maps. And, oh, the mods were awesome. It was one of the best PC gaming experiences I've had in years. And then I hear about Halo 2, and Microsoft just takes the hype train and goes full throttle with it. There's commercials. I'm subscribed to Red vs. Blue. I'm paying them a monthly fee so I can get my episodes a week early. Um, you know, I'm buying game fuel and Doritos. It was, I'm going nuts. Um, and I decide I'm going to Here it comes. I'm going to pre order Halo 2. <laughs> I don't own an Xbox, I own a GameCube. At, or wait. Yeah, yeah, I do own a GameCube at this point and a PS2. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to complete the collection. I'm going to get an Xbox. There is one game I'm buying this Xbox for, and I pre-ordered Halo 2. I got an, an Xbox. I got Halo 2. And I was the m most disappointed child ever. <laughs> I, I played. It took me like one day. I sat down and played through the entire Halo 2 campaign. And I sat down and I went, and I went where... Where's my big open environments? Where's my massive set pieces? Where this, it turned into a corridor shooter. Yeah, there were cool script events. Yeah, it wasn't the worst game ever. And yeah, the multiplayer was fun if you had live, which I didn't at the time. So that doesn't really count. But I bought it for the single player experience, which I was robbed of. Um, I, I hated Halo 2. It's not a bad game. There's nothing bad about it right it's not a poorly made it's not poorly designed it is just simply it, the only crime halo 2 has committed is being the campaign is less good than halo 1 and to me that was the biggest crime anyone could commit at the time but the, i mean halo 1 campaign was at such a bar that no shooter had ever done halo yeah. was revolutionary when it came to that it was it, it was, was it was amazing biggest, yeah. halo 2 the story was it told the good story everyone hated playing as the fucking arbiter he was the yep. worst worst missions ever but you didn't have the big worlds because the story didn't account or need them the first one was exploring the rings getting an understanding of what you're doing on and then second one was all about discovering the hive mind really mm -hmm. i just in I, how the I, elites I, lost favor <sighs> You know, there's there's two sides of me that are constantly warring. There's you know the the John Carmack side, uh, and then the the storytelling game developer side. And I can't even pick out a name right now, but the storytelling game developer side of me says you're exactly right. Halo Two had a story, had a set story, and it based the gameplay around the story. It took exactly what it needed to say, and it conveyed that through gameplay, and that is admirable. The John Carmack side of me says, "I mean, there's there's a famous quote by Carmack, which I don't agree with, but I get it. I understand why he said it. He said a, a game story should be, um, oh, I'm not, I'm gonna misremember, so I'm I'm just gonna skip it, um, but." He basically said, you know, the story should really exist as a side piece. No one really cares. Oh, he said the story in games is like the story in a porno, right? Mm -hmm. You're expecting it to be there, <laughs> but it's not really important. It's not why you came to the game, right? So, you know, yeah. Doom story, yeah, sure, demons, hell, whatever. Shoot some dude and stuff explodes. It's great. Mm -hmm. I wanted Halo 1 to follow the first one. I wanted it to follow the right. Carmack formula of gameplay first and everything else second. And what I got was the opposite. I was robbed of my expectations but for continuing the original theme of the topic i will say my favorite console exclusive at, oh 
doesn't even count anymore because it was re-released recently. Okay, I'm changing it. It's going to be Metroid Prime. I fucking love Metroid Prime. But that was re-released on the Wii. Damn it. <laughs> no, no, no. But, it's, it's, but Wind Waker. Time, at the time, it was console exclusive. I think that's yeah. more of a I, I would say Wind Waker. Wind Waker was by far one of the best games ever released. I go back and play it every couple of years. The soundtrack is amazing. The graphics, for as controversial as they were at the time, still look absolutely beautiful today, even in their low-res, low-poly glory. Uh, the gameplay is great it is not the best zelda game but it's a lot of fun up until you get to the whole paying for triforce quest deciphering bullshit it was annoying uh but everything else including the story for a zelda game which is saying a whole lot uh, um was magnificent it was wonderful mm -hmm. and also the like you said the graphics still being beautiful today was something that nintendo has done very well they oh, yeah. yes. they take make things very beautiful simple they don't make them ultra realistic and that has served them well even when they've had the most powerful of consoles yeah look at look at uh you know a great game like half-life one the original half-life right it, the game was one of the most realistic looking games because they had the character models with the jaws that would flap up and down <laughs> when they talked and it was really impressive for the day everyone yeah. freaked out um, and you look at it today, and it's almost laughable. Yeah. They're like, wow, that that was impressive. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, with Wind Waker, uh, if you look at a wireframe of the, the models in Wind Waker, you're like, they did that with, like, eight polygons and a, a normal map. Like, there's there's literally nothing there. But you watch it in action. It's, it's a flowing cartoon. It's a Disney movie of a video game. Nice. Yeah, I'd say for mine, it would have to probably be Ogre Battle 64. Yeah. It was the sequel to uh, March of the Black Queen on the SNES and predated the tactics. The tactics, however, did not follow the same kind of gameplay. It's a squad-based, turn-based, uh, tactical RPG. In short, yes. you can sink 100 hours into it in one playthrough, get the worst ending possible, and still want to play it five more times over. Nice. It's very Sounds deep. Good. Lots of forks in the story. Very good game. I'm going to add that to my list. And Tom helped me finally find it. I have the physical copy I bought off our buddy who works at a pawn shop. But I don't have a 64 with me. So he helped me find a working ROM for it. So Nice. Uh, so, current day... Something just launched yesterday that I've been debating on, but now I've since waned my um, desire to get the PS4 Pro. It, I don't know how much you guys know, it is essentially a um, mid generation release of the PlayStation with a lot more horsepower. Mm. It is two and a half times the processing power of the current PlayStation 4. So would you say Sony is trying to make their console great again? Oh. I would say that they made it great again. <laughs> um, it's an entry point. Uh, oh, God, I just forgot the sales point. I think it was... Uh, it's a hundred more dollars. Yeah, it's a hundred more dollars than the current PS4. So, Which isn't bad if you're looking for you know a new console. If you're coming into this and saying, I want to buy a PS4 today, why wouldn't you just throw down an extra hundred to get the Pro model? Right, exactly. I'm in a situation where we have the 4, we have a 4K TV, and I was thinking, hmm, PS4, one of the bigger selling points is supposed to, it has output for native 4K and HDR. The reviews are coming back, and a lot of the 4K ready games aren't pushing a full 4K yet. They're pushing some halfway res and rendering up. Or scaling that's, up, sorry. Yeah, that's kind of... Well, Rendering 4K is pretty intensive. A lot of PCs can't even do that. So, I, yeah, that's, I agree. For that to be a consistent thing, maybe next console's generation. Well, I can still think they're getting at this one, but it's not <laughs> going to be a lot. Right. It's going to be your exclusives who can actually tune to your console. Mm -hmm. So it looks like it's $400 for the PS4 Pro. Okay, so three so for the for, standard. For people that don't already have a ps4 that's probably the better way to go especially if you have a 4k tv um, a lot of the reviews seem that 
there was a difference in quality. You could tell it looked better on a 4K TV. Not on a 4K TV, they would run better, but maybe not $100 worth better. Or if you already have a PS4 and you don't have a 4K TV, it's probably not worth another $400 for the little difference you'll get out of it. As yeah, well if as you're, you if did you're running... Go ahead, go ahead. All right. If you're you know running a 1080p screen with your current PS4, you know for the extra 20 to 30 frames per second you're going to get out of the Pro, it's not really worth the $400 upgrade. I was going to say that's actually something that some of the games are offering is um, it's an uh, option. They're giving you pseudo PC controls on it now where do you want performance or do you want beauty? Right. So you can get higher frame rate or you can get higher um, pixel count. That's so cool. It's... Which is probably the lead in to the PSVR tie-in that's that's going to happen with this thing. Right. Where yeah. some games will be exclusive to the PS4 Pro in VR mode because mm-hmm. they, they've got the dynamic controls that can say, all right, we're, we're pushing VR now. We have to have high frame rates, so let's let's knock these yeah. graphics down just a tad, right. so so we can get the good frames out of it and not make people sick. So if you're yeah. going to do PSVR, get the Pro. Yeah, that is how I would leave. <laughs> Absolutely, you. get the Pro. Though I, the reviews so far are um, for the Pro, the tracking was not improved through it. The tracking is still just the same. Uh, granted, so you're going through the camera, all of but the camera. yeah, yeah. But so the tracking seems to have not been computational issues keeping up. It is strictly the hardware of the uh, controllers and the camera, which is a good thing because that's easier to replace than yeah that's another really, CPU. <laughs> that's a really good thing because that is old technology that they shoehorn yeah. into their headset. Right. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you know. Uh, before the end of 2017, we saw the the PSVR Pro bundle with better yeah. tracking, mm-hmm. you know, Vive style dual laser guided systems with tracking, and you know, the Vive does a bunch of crazy tech stuff. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw Sony try to emulate that in their next release. And mm-hmm. there is one noticeable thing about the PSVR that really shocked me. So you go back to last gen, you had the Xbox 360 and the PS4. Xbox, they both backed two different media devices. Xbox 360 was a um, DVD HD backer, but it was detached from the box. Right. The PS3 was a native Blu-ray player. And mm-hmm. people were justifying the purchase of a PS3 as, I want to get a Blu-ray player anyway, and they cost $150, right. $200. Why not spend a little more and get a gaming console? Yeah. We're talking Which... now a PS4 who was the first of the Blu-ray that is going to be pushing 4K that does not have a blue K or a 4K Blu-ray player in it. It is not a 4K Blu-ray Ooh, player. That not. seems like an oversight. Yes. It seems like a huge oversight. It's rumored the Scorpio next year will have one for Xbox, but the PS4 Pro is not a 4K playing device for discs. I wouldn't they that's beyond me it, yeah it seems it, like a lot the next step. it has to be the price they're probably I mean, going, they're probably going to sell these at a loss because just think i have a 1080 and i just now can really push 4k if i wanted a 980 mm-hmm. is going to slow down running 4k that's the kind of graphics card quality you need for good 4k right. if the ps4 is pushing 4k they have a good graphics card Granted, they have the whole scale, buy a ton, get them cheaper. But you're still talking a $300 graphics card, and that's cheap. Yeah. This is so odd, because Sony started this in the PS2 era. You know, the thing that sold the PS2 the most was DVD players were coming out. They were, you know, a couple hundred bucks. But you could spend a little more and get a gaming console as well as a DVD player, which by the way, also has a remote that you can buy. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's one of the things that made the PS2 sell as well as it did. It's one of the best selling game consoles, if not the, I believe it is the best selling game console of all time. Um, Why Sony would change their winning strategy now, the strategy, I mean, the notion evades me. I have no idea why they would do that. I still hold to there the reason Blu-rays were seen as a standard. Had the yeah. 360 put HD DVDs internal, 
I think may have been an actual race rather than the landslide it was. Right. Um, I I do have to say, you know, I I don't own a PS4. If I'm going to buy a PS4, it's going to be the Pro today. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Sony and Microsoft are making huge, huge missteps by releasing, you know, the the fifty percent versions of their console um, by saying, all right. We have these consoles now that you bought expecting they were going to last for the next six to eight years. Um, but now we're going to have games out there that either don't take full advantage of your current hardware um, or they won't run on your current hardware. Now, Sony has come out and they said, oh, no, all, all PS4 games will run on the PS4 and the Pro. The Pro is just going to look better or perform better. And I'm sure that's the case today. There is mm-hmm. nothing that stops Sony from in the future saying, yeah, by the way, the Elder Scrolls 6 that's native 4K with HDR, with VR, with, you know, this crazy, you know, strap on meta suit that you put in and get into PSVR Pro version 9. And a few um, thousand only, bugs. Yeah, and, and a few thousand bugs um, only runs on the PS Pro. That is a major issue and and the issue is that consoles have always been this i plug it in it works yeah end of story end of story and you know downloads day one patching is threatening that the bigger threat comes in when i now need to think about hardware levels when making my game purchase it turns consoles into pcs and that's been the main differentiating dividing line is my pc i manage i look at specs i understand them i tweak sliders and i make it pretty that's why i bought a pc i like that kind of control with a console i have different expectations i want to plug something in hit the power button and be playing within the next five seconds that's all i want from a console this changes that if it just depends if they if they stay to what they say and that all games will run on both systems. As long as it isn't horrible to try to play it on a regular PS4 later down the road, then this just gives, you know, the more graphical enthusiasts or, you know, esports level players or whatever, a little we could see something easy. to spend their money on. <laughs> I don't think the issue is with the current PS4 holders. They're not going to be the ones yeah. with the issue. I think that console is always going to be supported. Where you're going to get bit is buying a PS4 Pro today, and in three years, the PS5 comes out. That's yeah. where the bite's going to happen. The adopters of the Pro have to beware. If you don't already have one, get it. You do really think hard. Do you really need it? You're doing mm-hmm. PSVR, and you have a 4K TV? By all means, trade in. Probably cost you 200 bucks. Yeah. Another, another big issue is that we could see what happened with, you know, granted, relatively few like i'm talking like less than five games on the n64 nintendo 64 with donkey kong 64 came with this little add-on it was a a ram expansion for the console because donkey kong 64 needed the extra ram to run the game uh so they just decided to pack it in and say here you get a game and you get a console upgrade with it didn't make anything else perform better just these few games that used it one of the games that used it was perfect dark one of the uh most celebrated shooters of that console generation um you could play perfect dark without the memory expansion but what happened is you couldn't use the campaign uh you got like a hand a small handful of the tiniest multiplayer maps with a few bots that weren't very ai heavy uh and relatively few guns compared to the few game uh, the the full game and a two-player max yeah and a two-player max and you could play that as perfect dark it really it wasn't perfect dark because you're missing 80 percent of the game but you could play it if that same thing happens to the ps4 and the pro where they say well you can play uh the elder scrolls 6 but it's really you and three dudes and you can fight those three dudes with either a sword or an axe but nothing else because nothing else will run on this but if you have the pro you get the full game with the crazy everything and all the bugs um if if those kind of splits start happening we're going to see a major major issue with the ps4 pro yeah but we're talking the scorpio and everything else you're talking they they know going into it i really hope so they know going into it that that would just be an absolute destroyer 
and back then that little expansion pack was huge i mean nowadays that kind of technology would be like sticking a whole another eight gigs of ram in the ps3 mm -hmm. or ps4 sorry yeah i don't think that the improvement while it is a lot it will make games on the ps4 run noticeably better I don't think it's going to ever be to the point where a game going out for the PS4 is only playable on one platform. I I don't know. In, in full that. scale. In full scale. I, you're talking yeah. about things like video RAM. And, you know, we've seen in GTA 5 that we were just talking about with the, the video RAM sliders. That can actually change the way the game plays. One of the options in GTA 5 is amount of pedestrians, amount of traffic. Let's say you play an Elder Scrolls game and there is, you know, 60% fewer trees or enemies or objects or, or particles or you name it. They just decrease the number of objects to squash it into the limited, you know, video RAM that the PS4.0 has. It could change the way the game plays, right? You're not going to be limited on CPU power and the RAM, I believe, stays the same between consoles. But video RAM, video RAM will be different. Uh, the PS4 does get an improvement on RAM as well. It will have a full the, dedicated eight gigs for the game. Entire the entire <laughs> console has just changed. This is not a PS4 anymore. This is an entirely new beast that happens to share the same processor. I would be very yeah. surprised if devs didn't do cut down versions for the PS4 in not just graphics but actual gameplay in comparison to the PS4 brethren. Yeah, I don't. We hope not, but we have to do. This I hope not. Thing. <laughs> I don't think we're going to see that personally. There's enough stuff you can take down in the graphics. There's enough outrage that would happen. Yeah, there's enough stuff you can do to that. uglify a game that won't affect its gameplay nowadays. Yeah. Because back in the 64 days, a rock had 180 points. Now a rock has a million and five points. <laughs> you just take half of those out, the rock's still kind of round, and you just freed up a lot of RAM. Yeah. So so what what happens with you know let's let's say you have a game that's very physics heavy to do all the calculations it's very ram heavy what if let's say because it is it always is let's say it's a bethesda game with a physics bug um <laughs> where the developers now have to bug fix against two different not two different code bases but two different platforms that the game is running on because in this one the way the RAM's working out, the way the calculations are working out, the if statement that says if you're not super powerful, you do this these physics because they're simpler and they'll fit into the budget, as opposed to these physics, which are the full game. Now you have certain bugs that'll appear on only one version of the console. That could mm -hmm. really, really hamper developers. Now, it's not going to bite everyone. I think it'll be a rare thing, but I guarantee you that will happen. Well, technically, that bug will be on both consoles. Yes, but but if they're if they're using breakpoints, if they're saying, all right, we're we're going to do simplified physics for the PS4, and then for the Pro, we get the full physics stack. There could be bugs that exist in one, but not the other. Well, from the way you slide it, yes. But if you put the beauty of the game all the way up, you're putting the physics stack down, which means the PS4 is still going to hit that. That's what I'm saying. It'll be on all both. depending on the, on how they build it. Yeah, you'll still hit both. You're going off a singular code base with just sliders. Is what it's going to be. It's just like a computer, a computer game. You're not going to have a uh, dev having to go through and debug for an AMD this and then go up to a top end AMD. They're both the know. same architecture. You do see that though, because with remember the the split in Nvidia graphics when PhysX came out, you had the cards that could push the same level of graphical quality, but one had PhysX and the other didn't. Now, PhysX, as You're it was You're talking used different those, there. That's like something actual architecturally different. So in those games, PhysX wasn't actually used as a gameplay driver. It was really used for cloth physics and making things pretty. But if you did use something like that, and yes, the, the systems would be different, right? If you used it for gameplay. Yeah, the way I've right. understood this, this is just <laughs> upgrade. That architecturally, yeah. this is the same console with the just upgraded. Right. So, so what is this? What do you guys think this is going to do to the console cycle going forward? So, this is the first time they've done a PS four point five or whatever. <laughs> it's so. funny because it's essentially a new gen because they're doing a point five. 
Microsoft's doing a point five, and Nintendo's mm-hmm. just releasing a whole goddamn new console. <laughs> yeah, which is also a point five. Because let's be real. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's with good. a point five. There's not as much that needs to start over. They can people can keep developing games with the same architecture they're used to for this current consoles, but they can just do more with it. Those so for those who buy consoles, I think this favors them heavily. Because the way it works, you normally don't buy a Xbox, a PlayStation, and a Wii U all at the same day. You don't do that. Like with what I did, I had my Xbox 360, rocked it for a while, rocked it for a good three, four years, and then I got a PlayStation. So mm-hmm. what you're going to end up doing with this mid-year cycle, you're actually going to hit the entry point to probably half of the console player base looking to branch out to get the other console now. Yeah. Yeah. So you think a lot of people are going to bypass the the initial new console launch for the next upgraded version? Yeah, you'll end up with like an Xbox One and a PS4.5. Or an X, or a PS4 and an Xbox Scorpio. Mm-hmm. I see that trend continuing forward. I think this just, it, it further blurs the line between PC gaming and console gaming. You know, no longer are you saying, well... I'm picking this horse, and I'm going to ride it to the end. Now you have to think, well, do I want this hardware, and is this going to work with this peripheral or this TV or this monitor, or I want to do these things with it? You're now, instead of saying, I want to play video games on a television, you're saying, I want to play video games on you know, one of two televisions that I have, either ultra high def or high def, mm-hmm. but do I, I may or may not want to do VR. So now, now your flow chart for do I want to video game with a console has just become exponentially more complex. Well, I mean, um, your I, consoles have always had peripherals for that. The PS3 did not come bundled with HD capabilities. You had to buy a peripheral. You had to buy an adapter for HD. It came with a standard red, yellow, white adapter out of the box. Right, but I, I, it's it's even bigger than that though because it's it's not you know buying a small chunk of hardware to make it connect to something different, right? This is this is buying a different platform. It's it's not I I'm gonna plug something else in. It's I'm going to buy something else entirely. It's doing the same exact thing though. I mean, you're literally unplugging one, plugging the other in, and it's way, done. Way different price points. Way different price points. You you look at you know for um, the <laughs> an HDMI cable. Uh, no, 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 versus... no. I'm saying a PlayStation Four first four point five. You're just unplugging the four and putting in the five or four point five. Oh, yeah, Nothing no, no. changes. It's that. still plug and play. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. But but the the difference is you know the price point. Not just between the two, but the price point also between your sunk cost and the cost of an upgrade. Um, someone coming into this brand new has got a lot of choices between, you know, do I buy, you know, in, in six months, do I buy the deeply discounted PS4? Well, it depends on where I'm using it, how I'm using it, what I want to play, and what I think is going to happen in the future, right? Yeah. It, it, basically, it mirrors the way you buy PC components today, right? I bought a 980 Ti because it was deeply discounted. The 1080s were getting ready to come out. And I knew, you know, at, at that point, the gap between the two wasn't large enough that I would want to spend the extra money. I mm-hmm. did go through the effort of figuring that out. Console owners have never had to do that before. I think they can. I'm not saying that they're, they're drooling idiots. What I'm mm-hmm. saying is that the landscape has changed. It's not just cartridge TV video game. It's use case consideration, breaking down pros and cons, eh, what am I using this for, cartridge TV game. Uh, it's it's very similar to how PC buying works today. I, I don't think, I, I think it changes the way people are going to perceive consoles. Yeah, well. We'll just well, have to see, I guess. Reviews are starting to come out. Launch yesterday. I'm still debating here probably going to wait until after christmas and probably end up pulling the trigger yeah because i really want to try the psvr <laughs> really got to want to get hands on with that see how console ready is so recap ps4 pro if you have a 4k tv consider it if you already have a ps4 Not how yet. much expendable income do you have <laughs> <laughs> if you and already do, have a ps4 and if already you have a, VR. Yeah. 
if you have a 1080p monitor and you already have a PS4, you could probably skip it. You probably should skip it. You're only yeah. going to see frame rate improvement on yeah. certain games. No, only 30 titles are uh, pro ready right now. And if, if you will, are going to be a heavy PSVR user, that should push you the towards pro. the pro yeah. side of the equation. Yes. Okay, well, I think that we've already... wraps it up, doesn't it? Yeah, I we've already so. ranted plenty long tonight. So, um, Adam, I we think you have, have us a uh, random fact for the day. Yes, I do have a random fact for today. Because I'm not done talking about Bethesda. <laughs> Everyone loves Skyrim Bethesda. Skyrim was released on this day of 2011. Five years ago, Skyrim was released. And we Excellent are still game. buying it today. Yes, they are. Re-released and still selling like fucking hotcakes. And about to release on a console that isn't out yet. Again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't hate on Skyrim. And I can't no, you can't. It, it was such a good game. Six times. I put a lot of time into that. Their games are really good. I hate on the whole review thing previously, but their games are good. Yeah. Are. And I think that's all we're going to have for you today. So you can get at us anytime at fanmail at 72pinconnector.com for email. At 72PC Podcast. Catch us on YouTube at 72 Pin Connector or our Twitch page, which is 72 Pin Connector. Well, tv.72pinconnector. Well, till next and week. And our website. Oh, and our website. Yeah, yes. Yes. website. Thank where you, Where you can subscribe to our podcast in high quality MP3 audio straight to your device every single week. You can follow us on Twitch. Watch us live every Friday night. And by watch, I mean see our splash screen while we talk live at you. We're doing video eventually. Or you can just go to YouTube if you would like to see the splash and listen to us because you're on the computer. So and however, keep an eye out on the Twitch page because we also stream our games as we play throughout the week too. So we do. Yes, we. It's will. not just a podcast. We have other things. And Game we reviews have more things will be coming. coming soon as well. So until next week, talk to you guys later. See, See you. Everyone.